Hey, hey, it's the Web Strategy Show. This is Jeremiah, and I'm here with Gary, Gary Angel, CEO of Symphonic. Hi. Welcome. So we're going to talk about um, analytics, and this is a topic that I've been on out, you know, out there. I went to eMetrics Summit, and this industry is exploding because there's a lot of websites out there, uh, and people really need to figure out what's happening in their websites. A lot of resources and corporations go to their sites. The problem is, this is a, a budding new industry, and there's new people coming there, and they need to get information on how to do it, and um, look, and trying to find a process to measure it. It's, it's just kind of up in the air. So Gary's going to share with us um, some ideas on that. So give me an example, Gary. Uh, what are some options out there for somebody that wants to get started or a company that's trying to measure and there's just a lot of data there on their website? You know, I think if you think about the way people learn anything, and we're in a situation where there is no college degree in web analytics. You know, right. there's, there's no way to get a formal education in it. So I think most of us have learned by doing. We've learned on the job. And if you think about the way you do that, I think what people generally turn to are a lot of internet resources out there. But they're very scattered. You, know, you can go read people's blogs, but they'll give you little snippets of how to do things. Little, I did this this way, or I did this that way. But no real insight into how it applies to your particular situation or what you're doing. And it's often very disconnected. You know, it's a lot of isolated bits of advice. Um, there's starting to be some books that are coming out. But I think in a lot of cases, the books tend to live at a very high level, a sort of abstract theoretical level about you know, why web analytics is valuable and what are some good ways to think about web analytics. Rather than how to do Rather it. Rather than how to do it. Right. I find that, that lots of analysts are really struggling when they first sit down in front of a web analytics tool like SiteCap or HBX and say, okay, I know how to drive the tool, but how do I do the analysis? Um, and I think that's really the hardest part for somebody to learn. It isn't about learning how to use the tool. That's the easy thing. I think the hard thing is learning how to do the analysis. Um, and what we've done, actually, because we're a consulting company, we have this problem. We've had this problem, I think, longer than most other people have. We've been trying to hire web analysts for a couple of years now. Um, and what we've found is that really the best way to get people up to speed um, within web analytics is to sort of give them an intellectual framework, a way to think about web analytics that allows them to do it much more effectively. Like a playbook. Like a playbook. And I think for, from everybody's experience, it's just so much easier to do something um, when you're working inside a method that you can understand, a framework that makes sense of what you're tackling. And I believe with web analytics, that's true in spades, where there's so many reports and so much information and so many different things you could look at. It's really helpful to have a method that you can sort of follow to say, oh, I get it. This is what I should be looking at first. This is what I should look at next. And this is kind of what it all means. Some, some analysts I, I talk to, they say that maybe a framework or standardization may not work all the time. You know, you, you need to be variable depending on uh, whatever the situation is or whatever your site does. You know, every website is different. And I think that uh, I come from a background where I, I'm sort of inherently suspicious of overbuilt methodologies that come out of a specific business like manufacturing and maybe worked really well in one particular case but don't do such a great job everywhere else. So I think there's really something to that. I think when you think about a method, you have to understand what it can and can't accomplish for you. Um, the method that we've come up with, functionalism, I believe it applies to a lot of different kinds of websites, and it's a useful framework. It's a great way to get started. Um, but that being said, I don't think it does apply to every situation and every website and every kind of analysis. When we work with clients, I'd say about 50 to 60 percent of the time, we start with a functional analysis, and it's almost always a significant piece of what we do. It's rarely all of what we do. So I think, well, I guess what I would say about that is, is that a good method is never going to capture all there is to know about a field or discipline. But I believe that it can get a new person, a beginning analyst, or, or maybe an analyst who's, who's been in it for a year or so, but still sort of struggling to get their feet on the ground and really figure out how this stuff works. I think that's the kind of person who can benefit most from methodology that can sort of help them make sense of their problems and get them up to the point where they can start making more intelligent decisions about what they like and don't like about it. I get it. This is really, like, there's a need for a strategy to be more efficient or to make things work repeatedly over time, but yet it's still flexible. So. What is functionalism? What is, that's a great question. Well, the idea behind functionalism is, is pretty simple. 
The idea basically is, is that every page on your website was put there for a reason. I mean, you don't just build we pages hope. and there we hope. I mean, and, and I think that is true. Even if the reason wasn't a good one, nobody sits down and puts together a page without thinking that it was supposed to accomplish something. And as we sat down and looked at websites, what we realized was that there, was a, there were a lot of different things that pages were supposed to accomplish. And I think one mistake that people make is that they sort of think that every page on a website is all about selling. But it's not. There are a lot of pages on, the web, on most websites that have little or nothing to do with actually selling a product. There are pages whose primary purpose is navigational. They're designed to move people into the areas of the site that matter to them. That's really important. And almost every website has a set of pages that are navigational. They're not selling anybody anything. You know, when you look at that page, it's not telling you about products. It's not telling you how great the company is. It's trying to get from you what you're interested in and move you to that direction. Search is a good example of that, right? Search is not a, search is not a selling page. Page, search is a navigational page, and it needs to be measured in terms of how well it's moving people into the right places in the website, not in terms of how well it's selling them, because it isn't. There are pages on the website that are designed to sell, and we have a bunch of different classifications for looking at those, because again, we realized that not every selling page is created equal. We, we divide pages up into things we call convincers, pages that really are desi designed to convince you that this product or this company is the right choice. But then there are pages we call closers. Those are pages designed to get you to do something, the action part of the process. Those are often two very distinct pages on the site. And because they have different functions, they need to be measured differently. And I'll give you an example of that. A convincer page is something that's designed to persuade people. And persuasion often happens over multiple sessions and longer periods of time. So if you want to measure how effective a convincer page is, you've got to look at what's happening over multiple sessions. And a classic example of this was we did some work a, a few years back for Ford in Mexico. And they're a little unusual in that they actually sell cars online because there's fixed rate pricing in Mexico. They can't discount the cars, so they sell a lot of cars online. And one of the questions they asked us, a big long list of questions, but one of the things they were most interested in was what do people do in the session when they buy a car? That seems like a pretty good question, right? I mean, that, that seems like an interesting thing to know. And we came back and we answered the questions for them. And we got to this question and we said, you know what? What they do in the session when they buy a car is they get onto the home page, they click on the car, they click buy, and they buy it. Why is that? Well, they've been on the site for like three months prior to this. They've looked at hundreds of pages prior to this. The only session that isn't interesting in terms of what worked to convince them to buy the car is the session when they bought the car. That's so true of so many sites where people are being convinced to buy. You need to look at those pages in terms of how they're performing over time. But a closer page is different. If a closer page is designed to get somebody to act now, you measure how well it's doing that in the session where they viewed that particular page. So this idea that, that, that every page on a website has a function and that there, there must be specific KPIs, measurements to that function, um, is really what functionalism is about. And what I sort of say is it's a way to take this sort of KPI stew of hundreds and hundreds of KPIs, things we might look at, and decide which are most appropriate in a given situation for a given type of page that's supposed to be accomplishing a specific thing on your website. So could, I understand this is, a, this is a good idea. Can a web page have multiple functions? That comes up a lot, and I think yes. I mean, I think we find that in the real world, um, there are pages that are very explicit to one function. They're just designed to do one thing. We also see cases where a page maybe has a convincer function, but it also has some navigational functions as well. What we recommend in that case is that you measure both those functions. If a page is designed to do two things, measure how well it's doing those two things. What we do find sometimes, and I find this amusing, sometimes when we're working with a client and we'll sit down and we'll start talking about a page, and someone will say, it's kind of a router page. And someone else will also say, yeah, that's true, but it's also designed to convince people. And someone else will say, that's true, but there's this information over here, which is sort of designed to reassure them. And by the time we get to the third function, pretty much everyone's shaking their heads and saying, you know, we tried to pack too much into this page. Right. Now, functionalism is not a design method in the sense that it doesn't say you can't have 10 functions on a page. It doesn't say you can't have five functions on a page. But I think what I've found from practical experience 
is that when you sit down with managers and marketers and designers, by the time people have come together and said that a page has more than two functions, most of us are kind of thinking we try to put too much on that page. Not to say the method says you can't do that, right. it's just that sort of the real world response. And, and I think what happens is, what I've found is that a nice side benefit from the method is that it does get people like designers and marketers thinking about, in a very crisp fashion, what What's did I goals? need to accomplish What are the with goals this? of the site? And that's the thing I'm hearing, Absolutely. interviewing all kinds of thought leaders and practice leaders to find the goals of your site first before you do anything. Well, and, and I think, but sometimes people people do that at the high level. They do the basic work, okay, and sometimes it's really obvious. They know what right. they're I want to sell somebody something, or I want to generate a lead, but they stop doing that as they drill down. And we're a very detailed, we're a hands-on tactical company, and, and the truth is that when you build a website, you're building blocks of pages. You're working with you know content, with, with tools, with pages, and those are the things that, if you've decided at the high level what the purpose of the website is, you still need to make the same decision about each page on your website. Because it isn't true that for every page on the website, its function is the same as the high level site. It has to somehow drive to that or be related to that. But another good example I give a lot of times is thank you pages. After someone's bought something, or say, you know, a classic example for a lot of our clients, someone downloaded a white paper, you get a thank you page. What's that page supposed to do? And how are you going to measure whether it's effective or not? Well, what we found is that the best way to think about those pages is to say, what do I really want people to do after that? Well, somehow, in most cases, what I want them to do is re-engage with the site. That's particularly true with lead generation sites where someone just downloaded a white paper for me and all I give them is a page that says thank you with no other places thank to you, go. Thank you, goodbye. Say, thank you, goodbye. Why is that goodbye? Why do you want to lose those people after they just declared a strong interest in some particular aspect of your business? And so with functionalism, we set up a bunch of KPIs that basically measure thank you pages by how well they re-engage people. And the measurement there is really simple, but what's nice about it is it gets people thinking about, I've got this page, what do I want to do with it? I've got real estate here that's valuable, how can I take advantage of that? So this is great, and I, I see the benefits of this. Now, is this something that can be shared with others? Well, where can I learn about functionalism? Uh, there's been, I, I personally have written a lot of articles about it, but the really best resource is a very extensive white paper that we wrote. It's available on our website. It's free. You don't even have to register. You can go out and download the white paper. Um, it's very extensive. It talks about the different page types that we've identified. It talks about the KPIs for those page types. It talks about which KPIs we think are most important, which ones we kind of think are secondary. Maybe they're interesting to look at, but maybe not. That's really the single resource that I point to most to people to say, if you want to find out what functionalism really is, if you want to see what it's like from a technical perspective, start there. It's, a, it's really the best resource for it. It's something we're planning to sort of update and pop, republish again probably later this summer, but it's, it's a really great resource. I think very clear and very easy for someone who's even just getting started in web analytics to take that white paper and get started doing functional analysis with really no other help. Or even web managers should take a look at this. Hey, hey, I'm building this page. Here are the goals that we're trying to achieve. Let's make sure that this page you know, meets these type of goals. Absolutely. I found that when we started doing functionalism, we did it for us. We did it as consultants because we wanted a method that was really going to regularize what we did for clients and give us a platform from which we knew we could consistently drive value. But I think the biggest surprise about it was that the organizations who adopted it, they liked it not so much for the measurement benefits, but for the fact that it gave them a really crisp and clear way to think about what they were doing with each part of their website. And I think it was something that they could communicate with designers. It's a very intuitive approach. The marketing managers got it. The product managers got it. The designers got it. And it was a way for all the stakeholders in the website to sort of buy into what measurement could do for them and give them a new way of thinking about their own, their, what they were doing. I, I get it, Gary. So functionalism, go check it out. It uh, looks like part of a web strategy, uh, you know, your end goal. So where can I learn more about your site? Uh, it's www.symphonic.com. That's S-E-M-P-H-O-N-I-C.com. And a couple of things that are out there that I think are worth checking out in the resources section is where the white paper is. So okay. that's where you go for that. Also in the resource section, um, there's a section on articles, and there's a number of articles there about functionalism, which range from you know very very short, very crisp definitions of what it is to pretty extensive articles about 
cases where we've implemented it and different things that we've done with it. And then I also run a blog which is accessible from the Symphonic website, Resources Blog. And I've done a lot of blogs about specific applications of how to do analysis with functionalism. And I think that's a good resource as well. Gary, thanks a lot. You're my Thanks for coming to the show.